Hey everyone, it's Ellis, and this is going to be another speed VOD review today with G2 Esports versus Afrika Freaks. So we're just going to jump right in. Heimerdinger being banned away by Afrika, so it does not look like they've actually devised a counter to the Heimerdinger. And G2 locking in AA trucks as the first pick on blue side. I do think that that is a champion that is worthy of being first picked. I would be very... I, I don't know what's going on with Kai'Sa uh, at this tournament. I, I really don't know. It's like two weeks went by and then suddenly something... Or like two or three weeks went by. And suddenly so much has changed. Alright. Gragas now locked in as well, and then G2 Esports responds with a Tom Kimchi and a Jin. I don't know why the video is lagging. Let me try to go to 1.5. <coughs> Ow. <coughs> okay. Kaisa now locked in. You don't want to go to the second ban phase with so many ADCs already being taken away. And now, Afrika Freaks, they have the counter pick on the red side. They're banning away a Syndra. Something uh, some people were asking me about yesterday is where is Kossadin, um so far in this tournament, especially on red side. It is interesting to not see him appear all that much. LeBlanc being banned away by G2 Esports. And now Lissandra banned away as well by Freak of Freaks. And then Aurelia by G2 Esports as well. It's very interesting watching the, the world's picks and bans so far. Because it, it doesn't... It, it, it seems like uh, people's plans going into the best of ones are, are very... Ra not random, um... It, it, it's you can definitely feel that it's the best of one. So the rise is picked, and G two is hovering Cassiopeia. Traditionally, one of the best answers against rise. Camille now being hovered as well, so that might just be a jungle Camille. And then once the team compositions are fully drafted, then we can talk about what everyone's trying to achieve. And that's a Zillion being hovered. Is that real? No. Okay. What? 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 Oh, is this going to be top? Oh, okay, top rise. Okay, this is actually... So, let me uh, let me tell you guys some history. Um, Keen and Khan are the two top rise uh, players in Korea. They're, they're th like two of the only people, um, as well as Jisoo, uh, who I think was playing in Brazil this last split. Um, he formerly played in Europe, uh, JISU, um, the, top, the Korean top laner. Um, those three are predominantly the only people that play top rise uh, in Korea. So, anyways, with that being said, let's talk about some of the, the goals of each team comp. So, um, interestingly, top lane Atrox actually wants to get ahead. One of the problems is, is that if Keen actually plays the matchup very well, it can be very difficult for Atrox and he can end up falling behind. This is a problem because it's a blue side Camille who doesn't want to actually venture up to top lane too much, especially if Ryze ends up ever getting a freeze in front of his red side turret. It becomes very, very difficult because Camille isn't the type of champion that wants to venture up, go to her gromp, and then maybe path into the enemy's golems and then do anything like that from the, from the left-hand side of the map. I just think that's very, very poor, especially because Gragas does actually have incentive to be on the left-hand side of the map because of the golems and because of the rates. Um, so this is a little bit of a problem already for G2. Um, another thing that we have, or that we can talk about, is that they have the Jin and the Tom Kench in the bottom lane against the Kai'Sa and the Alistar, uh, but the issue is, is that Camille is going to be approaching from a red side jungle, so it's a little bit difficult to gank. So already, Camille is actually sort of semi-pressured in top and in bottom, depending on how Afrika plays, and it's very easy to actually fade the ganks away from Camille. And Camille has to accelerate, because she has the Cassiopeia and she has the Aatrox up in top lane. She needs to accelerate against this team composition, because this team composition has way superior scaling. Because remember, this is a jungle Camille, so it's not going to have the same exact economy that a top lane Camille would traditionally have, which means that it's split push and everything like that comes online later, if you're even going to make use of uh, a jungle Camille split push. So, 
On the side of uh, Afrika Freaks with Spirit, he actually has the luxury of knowing that any time he counter or match ganks Camille, whether it be in mid, top, or bottom, it is a nightmare scenario for G2 because of the way in which these champions have to commit to the 2v1. So if like Camille and Atrox actually want to go on to rise, Camille has to use her hook shot and get on to rise. Then she get she eats her own prison. Gragas comes around, hits her with a body slam, and it becomes so difficult for her to actually escape from that point because Rise is just gonna be able to stick on top of her. Gragas with the slows, it's gonna be almost impossible for Camille or Atrox to end up getting away. Likewise, in mid lane, if Camille goes on to uh, Galio with the Cassiopeia and Gragas is there for a match or a counter gank, again, extremely heavy commitment. Uh, out of the G2 side, whereas if Gragas actually goes for a gank with his body slam and stuff, due to the nature of how these champions are, with maybe the exception of Atrox, if it's like a Gragas and Rise onto the uh, Atrox, um, he, they can still get away. Like, Gragas Galio can still get away from a match or a counter gank out of Yankos' Camille in mid lane against the Cassiopeia. Um, especially because these Galio is going to be naturally very tanky against the, the Cassiopeia. Um, Gragas is going to be pretty tanky as well, and Camille isn't the type of champion that you would expect to be doing counter and match ganks, not with these types of lane setups. And then likewise, in bottom lane, if Gragas were to commit onto Jin and Tom Kench, things I guess can get a little bit dodgy if the fight is actually taken near the bottom, uh, the bottom, so like, this is the brush, right? And you know this wall right here? So there's this wall, and then the golems are over here. You know what I'm talking about? If Gragas ended up going on to Jin and Tom like right here and Camille ends up match or counter ganking from anywhere inside of this angle, this is the only time where a bottom lane counter or match gank for a Camille could actually result in a really, really good turn against a Gragas. Any turn that would uh, occur like in the middle of the lane or further up in the lane or something, it's not really going to produce anything. Um, because again, the champion kits and their reliance on terrain and how wide open it is, it's just not very good. So. Afrika has a lot of wiggle room, um, they have superior scaling, and they have just such a, a good team composition. Like, their one item spikes are really, really, really scary and problematic for the G2 team composition. G2's team comp wants to fight at one item and two items, but the problem is that um, even though Ryze, it, it takes a little bit longer for him to come online, um, the Gragas and the Galio and the Alistar just make it so difficult for this team comp to actually do anything uh, to the Kai'Sa, and Ryze and Kai'Sa are both able to play front to back very easy against this team. The other thing that you should know is that this team has basically no siege potential or uh, reliable wave clear, and so if they don't roll some Mountain Drakes or Infernal Drakes, it becomes a nightmare if they don't end up capturing Herald early on to penetrate Galio's mid-tier 1 turret, but then ultimately siege tier 2 turrets and stuff. So, let's get into the game. Ah, I'm chewing, uh, I'm chewing nice. So if, if we're looking at uh, G2's team composition, it's, it's one that I like when you're against a vastly inferior team, um, but it's not one that I would actually like to have on the world stage. Although, I guess if we make the argument that it's a best of one, it could potentially be a good team composition, but I, I, it, like, I really, really don't like it. I wish that the uh, the Camille pick would be different. I think if the Camille pick was different, then they have more options available. <laughs> you can try to make it two times speed. J4 is worse than Camille. Twitch chat. Talia is much better than Camille, yes. Talia is much, much better. It's lagging too much. Hmm, I don't know what's causing it. Okay. So already some early aggression coming out. 
This is actually pretty even for both parties, though. Tushin's still in bottom lane. Yarnan might not be expecting that. Playing around it regardless. So right now you can see Camille, she's doing her red into her scuttle crowd. The issue is, is that if Cassiopeia is just going to push in Galio, and depending on how A.E. Trox up in top lane is playing, it looks like he's actually trying to push. This isn't what you want to do <clears throat> in the Rise uh, A.E. Trox matchup. Um, yeah, uh, Keen is actually winning the matchup quite hard right now. This is really, really bad. You can see that he's not going to be able to get any assistance from Yankos, and I really like what Gragas is doing. Gragas is just acknowledging, like, hey, I don't have to be anywhere, I don't have to gank anything, I'm just going to full clear. And they don't actually end up spotting Gragas, but... Um, Afrika knows where the enemy bottom lane just was, and now the pings are going down onto Camille. And so even though Gragas has to go up to his golems, look at the timing on all of this. Wonder's teleporting back into the lane, and this might actually demand that Yankos comes up to top lane. Um, because Keen is going to recall here soon. So Gragas is going to finish the golems, Keen's most likely going to recall, and as long as Keen can actually hold the lane in that state, this is a very, very dangerous moment for Wonder where he could definitely die to Ra- Oh yeah, this is this is a nightmare situation. Oh, the lane state's so bad. Wonder's coming in, he's gonna get a ward, he needs one against the Gragas. Gragas looks like he's actually content to just go to the Golem, or the Wraiths. They are coming up in about 20 seconds, so. But instead he actually comes down, he scryers, and he's looking to make something happen, but definitely G2 just saw all of that. Wraiths are about to come up in about five. Yep, they're there right now. So he's just gonna eat those, and remember, Gragas has the rubber banded camps that he can just go to. And you can see the Yankos is trying to make stuff happen, or he's just trying to get some intel or something, but it's very, very problematic for him to be on the Camille right now. And this is why um, a, a, a more flexible jungler that isn't reliant on accelerating, isn't reliant on getting gold in order to be relevant, would have just been a better pick. And look at Keen, still hasn't even actually used his teleport. He's able to just hold this lane right in front of the turret, and this is what we talked about in the, the pick ban. Yankos is only down a camp, and Perks is creating a, a pretty decent CS lead, at least in mid lane. And Hyarnan has a CS lead down there in bottom against the Kai'Sa, so it's all okay, and Yankos right on top of that Scuttle Crab right away. Any of the farm-centric junglers would be really good here, at least with the way that Afrika Freaks drafted. Like, Talia, um, Talia would probably be best, most likely. Yeah, Talia, Talia would definitely be best. Uh, any, any of the farm-centric junglers would be acceptable in this spot. Zack would, Zack would be okay. Zack wouldn't be terrible. Graves is so-so, and the reason that I the reason that I say that Graves is so-so is because you have so many on hit, uh, you have so many on hit champions, and you really incentivize the opponent to go Ninja Tabby. Or Zach is actually, Zach is genuinely okay here. Zach is truthfully okay. Trundle isn't as bad as some people might think in this spot. Nidalee is, Nidalee is actually okay. Nidalee is okay in this spot. Some people are going to be like, well, Nid well, Nid Nidalee is, is, is more uh, volatile than Camille, um, but if she works, she does what Camille is trying to do, but better. Because she offers uh, up the, the, the poke and the flexibility, but then she can also blitz around the map quicker than uh, Camille. Kane is really bad. Vi is terrible. Okay. So this is the first sign of something happening. So let's just take a look at how this all unfolds. <clears throat> you 
you can see Yankos is just basically running around. He's not able to really accomplish too much, even though he's, he's establishing map pressure and everything. So I don't know how this actually happens. So the blue, the blue handoff timing, this is something I've talked about in previous VOD reviews, where normally you'll see this actually be a timing where the bottom lane uh, of the red team will use it to capitalize on an Infernal or a Mountain Drake when the mid laner and the jungler are both uh, stuck on the left hand side of the map. Um, especially if the, the timing for your blue is up as well. But in this case, they actually have a Galio ultimate and everyone is already in position. And you can see that G2 is just not respecting this at all. And even though they know that it's coming, it's just not going to matter. Tom Kent's trying to run to Yarnan, but not really going to do too much. And now, I like what Afrika's doing. They're just recalling Galio. They're going to send him right into mid lane. He doesn't really help out too much. Take another quick look at the replay. And the problem here is that Camille, uh, I like what Yankos is doing. He's going, he's going to clear some wards. Uh, I, it looks like he ended up getting the Scuttle Crab, but there were no camps for him to take away from Spirit. I don't like that Spirit actually stayed in bottom. I don't like the fact that they tried to raise the bottom tier 1 turret, um, because they're under no obligation to raise the bottom tier 1 turret. They should actually be content to just acknowledge that Galio's turret in mid is not really taking that much damage. Kuro is really healthy, he's almost going to be able to complete his row as soon, and Ryze is just doing fine up in top lane. There's no reason to try to crack open that mid tier 1 and then rotate around the map. If we're talking about uh, the capturing of Cloud Drake, G2 I think actually needs to do it way more than Afrika, because Afrika is the team comp that uh, wants to sit back, stay at their tier 2 turrets, and then defend everything. I don't know what that teleport is, but that's really fucking bad. That was really, really bad teleport. So they, lo they lose bottom tier 1 turret, but it's not the end of the world. Because uh, uh, Afrika's champions are more gold efficient the longer that the game goes on. And even if G2 accelerates a little fast, it's not enough. They have to accelerate really fast, not just a little fast. So Keen almost actually has his teleport available. He's recalling right now. And you can see that uh, G2 is actually making a decision to try to stay in that bottom lane. And what this ends up meaning is that Afrika would be stuck inside of a long lane. And I don't. I think G2 is going to push out the lane, and I, I, I think that that's a very poor decision. And the reason that I think that it's a poor decision is because if you stockpile the wave uh, and make it a lot bigger and then crash it, you can rotate the Jin into mid lane um, and then have him in close proximity to the Herald. Obviously, you can maybe potentially launch an attack on Galio, force him to back up, draw Spirit, and draw Tushin into mid lane. Um, like, if this minion wave was delayed and a little bit bigger, it locks Kai'Sa up for longer, and then when you rotate Jin and uh, Tom Kench into mid lane, it demands that Gragas come into mid lane. And then with everyone being there, you can rotate up and attack Rise and force him off the turret. And then by the time that Kai'Sa unlocks the wave down in bottom, you're able to send one of the carries down back into bottom. I don't know what G2 is doing, um, but okay. They're going to end up getting a kill onto Spirit. <clears throat> And this is a, this is a semi-heavy investment, so let's talk about this. All right. So the only thing that they actually win out here if they, if they win this team fight is they, they get a Cloud Drake. Um, you can see that the teleport is coming in, the flash on Jin, they end up killing Spirit, and it looks like they're maybe going to be able to get Tushin, but then he just headbutts away, so it doesn't really matter. And now you look at the aftermath of it all, and all that's going to happen is they're going to get a Cloud Drake, and they... They commit a little bit heavy in order to doing this. Wonder's now in bottom lane. Rise is going to go up to top. He's going to get two C or he's going to get two waves of CS. Then eventually the wave will be caught by someone on G two. But it's not enough of a worthwhile victory. Yes, they end up getting a kill uh, onto someone from Afrika, but you have to factor in that now this likely means that another team fight won't break out for another couple of minutes, which is not what G two wants. <clears throat> Take another quick look at the replay. That Galio ultimate was really, really poor, and it doesn't even matter. Uh, you can just see Keen's not really able to do too much. G2 just has a better angle position, but even still, it looked like they were they were posturing and looking for some sort of a fight to unfold, <clears throat> but it really actually took a freak at a handshake on it.
So right now, G2, uh, a little bit under a 1k gold lead, which is not what they should be having at 15 minutes. They, they need more of a sizable advantage. Very important for them to get Herald. Herald is so crucial at taking away Galio's mid-tier 1 turret, and it's something that they really need to have happen. If anyone remembers the... Oh, that fucking sucks. Holy shit. Um, if anyone remembers the game uh, that G2 played against Flash Wolves or whatever, you know, the 0-0-1, um, you guys remember how difficult it was for their team composition to actually raise the mid-tier 1 turret, and this team comp is very similar in that regard. It is so difficult to take down that tier 1 turret, and losing the Herald there is just one of the worst things that G2 could ever have happen. If they, if they get the Herald... Uh, and they're able to just bring it mid and raise the mid tier one turret. The trades on kills doesn't really matter because they open up one of the most important neutral or they open up one of the most important objectives for Afrika to hold. And you can just see if they had Herald right here, this turret would be going down every day of the week. They would be able to get that turret, fall back to their jungle, eat their wraith camps, eat their golem, reset, send someone bottom, farm some waves, and then eventually allocate all their carries and stuff up to the top lane and raise the tier one turret. And then at that point, they would be up two turrets. Uh, they would have traded out in kills, they would have had the gold from the Rift Herald and whatnot. Also don't like the fact that Camille's actually itemizing semi-defensively. Like, yes, Hexdrink- like, so, um, a lot of people perceive, like, Hexdrinker and Maw of Malmordius as an offensive item, but truthfully, it's a defensive item. Um, I don't like that she has the Hexdrinker. Yes, it provides, uh, survivability against even Kai'Sa, Galio, Gragas, and Ryze. But I don't think that that's what Camille needs to be doing. Like, if you're gonna be picking Camille and then having her go into this, like, pseudo off-tank type thing, I, I think that the, the pick... I mean, that even suggests that the pick should have been different. Yeah, if he, it, it, it's really, really sad uh, missing the, the smite. That's a really, really brutal smite to miss. Super, super clutch for Afrika. Oof. And now, right now, like, G2 is a, 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 a team comp that does not want to be on the defensive. If, if they're on the defensive, something is seriously wrong. Because their team composition is already intending to dive and run into the opponents. But if they're having to do it from a defensive position, like initially, like if, if they're, you know, put underneath the turret and they have to close a 1300 range gap and try to get onto the opponent without the element of surprise, the team fight is just so much more difficult. It's like playing a, a, a trading card game. So here, I'll give you a Hearthstone analogy because I feel like more people in chat would maybe understand that. Imagine a Murloc deck going on the defensive. That's just not what Murlocs are supposed to do. That doesn't make any sense. Imagine, imagine mono red going into block mode. There, there, I gave you a magic one too. Okay. <clears throat> so right now, Afrika, I mean, they should be content to just wait on all their second items. It doesn't even matter that G2 is going to actually get a Mountain Drake, although that is one of the best drakes for G2 to roll because it helps with the Baron Burst potential and then obviously the split push in the later stages of the game. Um, I don't feel like Raj sh should be able to get away with just like, if I, if I rewind a while, right? We see where Tom Kench is right now and we see what Ryze is doing. It's not urgent to go for the Mountain Drake right now. And because they have such good vision control around mid lane, it's very easy to pull Wadded back and then bring him with someone over to here and then try to ult onto Ryze. At the, at the very least, you're gonna get Ryze's ultimate out of him. 
but I, I think in most cases Rise will end up dying, and I don't like how G2 is not looking for that in favor of actually just going for the mountain. I think this is a very poor decision. Like, it, it, it's good, it helps with barons and whatnot, but um, it, it, it should be very easy to just kill Rise, get your blue and everything. And even if Afrika ends up getting the, the Mountain Drake, like, you can't stall it, you can't do anything against it, it doesn't mean that much for Afrika to have the Mountain, because their, their intention is not to do anything with the Mountain. Like, all of your turrets are almost, they, they've almost gone down at this point, um, the Tier 2 turrets don't matter, because Afrika won't be pushing Tier 2 turrets without Baron, and due to the nature of G2's team composition, Afrika is going to have to go through them to get Baron regardless. It's not like the Mountain Drake is going to help with any sort of a burst. Look at that mid that mid tier one. It's such a thorn in G two side. They still can't get it yet. This is so problematic. It provides so much important vision for Afrika. They're gonna be able to eventually get it here. Although the items are almost all completed on on the side of Afrika, they're gonna concede the mid tier one here. It it I mean it 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 just stalls them. You can see they're gonna be later to getting their jungle camps and stuff. Wonder's now finally gonna go into bottom. He's gonna be met by Keen. Um but it it it's such a heavy commitment and Afrika was able to basically have no pressure uh being applied to them in top and bottom. And so right now, I mean, if you're Afrika, you don't want to be pushing up past your tier one turrets. Like we're, we're like so where Galio is right now is is fine. Like right here, right. Uh, you want to just go right here, maybe. Uh, you don't want to actually pass that. You don't want to pass this. You don't want to pass this. And then if you rise, you don't ideally want to pass this unless you have vision here and here. If you have vision here and here, you can go up past this. You can go to here. But realistically. All that uh, Afrika should want to do is play inside of this blue area. And when G2 eventually pushes up and stuff, then all that Afrika wants to do is play inside of this. This is fine. You just play inside of this area, you keep scaling to three, four items, and you basically laugh at the opponent and tell them that they're on a ticking time bomb. Afrika is uh, Afrika is not super far ahead right here, but Afrika is ahead. Yes, it takes such uh... oh hold on okay it it takes so much better positioning for G two to be able to win a fight. Um, and any time that their they, their team comp would try to engage inside of nooks and crannies like the red side jungle, it's going to be too difficult because of how spread up they can be and how good Afrika is if they form a phalanx. Uh, during the fight and Ryze and Kaisa just have such an easy time playing front to back against the Camille and against the AA Trox and Jin's damage is almost negligible against the front line of Afrika and so because of that you end up being reduced to perks as your primary DPS source but the issue is is that these champions can actually throw back at perks relatively well even though he has some magic resistance. AA Trox. What is a phalanx? Uh, that's a phalanx. It's 
say formation that doesn't allow anything. Okay, history lesson for Twitch chat. Okay. So all they have to do is hold a phalanx. Okay, so at this point, um, Afrika manages to see that Jankos, or Yank Jankos, Jankos is a little bit out of position. They went to try to get a kill onto him. They end up getting his flash away from him, and now they can just go back into turtle mode. You look at the atomization that's completed. Rise is almost going to have Zanya's Hourglass soon. It looks like uh, Gragas is probably going to have his uh, Stone Plate completed relatively soon as well. Kais is going to be on a third item. All they have to really do is just wait until 30 minutes. At 30 minutes, the, the team fights become so much more difficult for G2. It's such a heavier investment for them to commit to team fights, and they're so much more reliant on having their summoner spells available than Afrika is. Mm. Wonder ends up getting knocked away by Tushin, and you can see that G2 is actually desperate. They're going for a Baron Burst. They end up getting the Baron, but from this angle, I don't think, yeah, they can't win a fight. There's no way they can win a fight from this angle. Kramer in the back line. And now, yeah, it's, it, this is going to be a nightmare. Yeah, there's no way. All right, so let's talk about why this just went bad. All right, so they're going for a Baron burst, and we talked about how their team needs to go in. And when you, when you look at this team, what's one thing that you notice? Cooldown, cooldown centric champion, cooldown centric champion, right? Semi cooldown centric champion, semi cooldown centric champion, okay? Needs to apply auto attacks, but can't apply auto attacks when needing to defend these champions from a barrage or an assault. So his passive and his Q and his autos are virtually useless. So inside of this Baron pit, Afrika is able to actually get such an advantage because of G2's concave and how their concave isn't advantageous to them due to all currently being on temporary cooldowns. Just look at Camille. Look at her. Like, it's, it's so painful to just be on cooldowns and everyone's on cooldown. And then you can just see Tushin's able to get this massive knockup and everyone on G2 is on the retreat because they're so reliant on combos in order to make things happen. And this isn't the type of formation that G2 wants. They want Camille engaging with Hookshot. They want Camille threatening backline and forcing the Afrika frontline to peel for Kramer and Keen to play front to back and allow Perks and Yarnin to just keep advancing forward almost like a riot squad or something as they try to keep you know hitting uh the members of Afrika but they're not able to do that because they're on the back foot and so it's sort of like a run for the hills but it just doesn't matter there's no universe that G2 can win a fight like this and very similarly um if let's say um Afrika was posturing with them and G2 was here and then Afrika was here this toy this sort of runway fight that they would fight or th that they would end up taking a fight in is really really bad for them as well because it's such an easy uh trajectory for Afrika to handle all the combos and everything and then again play front to back so even if Jin and Cassiopeia keep trying to advance up here the 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 straightforward narrow direction that Wonder and Yankos would have to take to advance onto Afrika's team comp is way too beneficial for a Kai'Sa or a Rise and things like this get even worse inside of the nooks and cranny of this red side jungle right over here So they end up having one member survive with Baron, but that's not a worthwhile capture because G2 is so reliant on Baron in order to making their, their pushes actually work. Even though they have the, the Mountain Drake, one man Baron is not enough. And so now with Baron being off the map as long as it is, it gives Afrika so much breathing room and even more time to scale.
G2 going to be able to raise this mid tier 2 turret. That should be pretty easy. They're very, very reliant on Wonder's Baron buff. But once it fades, things just get so ugly. I like how confident, though, G2 is playing with, with some of their decisions. I think that it's, it's genuinely quite refreshing to see. They're, 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 they're continuously, uh, at least in some games, playing up to a, a higher standard than I, I genuinely expected. Even though Afrika's team composition is, is designed to be more patient and slow-paced, it, it's still nice to see. G2 is behind right now, but it's not it's not unwinnable. Uh, if they can get the next Mountain Drake, and if they can get the next Baron, they can definitely still win the game. Losing the top uh, inhibitor turret at that point doesn't really matter. It's a small bit of gold, but because the turret was on its last leg anyway, it's something that G2 would be guaranteed to get in the event that they would secure Baron. Even if G2 could hypothetically get that inhibitor, it does not change the current state of the game at all. Because Afrika is still just going to have the same exact lane assignments that they would have even if the inhibitor was down. And so it doesn't actually change the outcome. Because regardless, the same team fight will unfold with or without Baron, and if the inhibitor was up or down, it changes absolutely nothing. All that matters is does G2 get Baron, because if they get Baron, and they get it at like 36, 37 minutes, it, it's already too difficult for a Freaka to handle, given what that turret's HP was. So it results in basically the same thing. And so now Baron is live, Mountain Drake is live as well. Afrika is trying to clear out vision around the Baron. And this is actually a really good timing to do so because you can see how massive the wave is up in top. Galley, oh shit. Oh, that's really sad. Oh, that's probably going to be the end. Yeah, G2's team caught. Well, Cassiopeia inside of like a, a, a really narrow corridor. Like these wraiths and like like this right here. This is really good for Cass, and then obviously this is really good for Cassio. River is not wide enough, uh, or it's not as good for Cassio as what the other stuff is. What? what? Yeah, Jin Lee ship. Ah, oh, this sucks so bad. Oh, 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 huh? Wait, Ankos didn't go for it. Had to go for it. Oh, wow, that's really good by perks. Oh. Okay. I mean, per perks did uh, quite a good job, but it, it doesn't matter. Lose losing the Baron and then losing the Mountain Drake is way too problematic because Afrika's team composition is just so much better. We can take uh, another look at this fight. I don't know why Yankos doesn't go for the steal. It's really weird. You're never going to win the team fight in a million years. You should just go for the steal. doesn't even matter if you lose the GA. Because... G2 is all in. Like, their, their team composition cannot stand to dance more times with Afrika. Like, they cannot go toe-to-toe -to -toe in, in straight-up team fights. It's just not feasible. So Yanko should have just acknowledged, like, okay, if, if he dies there, 
it doesn't really change too much. Afrika is still going to get the same exact things that they're going to get regardless of if he dies or not. But if he steals the Baron, it dramatically changes the game. Yeah, but it's on him as a professional player to calculate the speed at which Baron is going down when he saw temporary vision from Jinzar. Alright, and so right now, even though the gold score is even, it does not tell how far behind G2 actually is. Here comes Rise, and Kuro still hasn't even entered it. That, that Camille is just absolutely useless. The pick is so useless. Okay. This game is definitely going to be over now, I assume. Afrika's just going to run out mid lane. Um, if, G if, if G2 had gotten Herald, I can't say that they would have won. Because again, the, the team comp is very, very strong for Afrika. Um, well, Herald was really, really big, though. Herald is so big. It's really, really sad. Like, where, where is Herald? I don't know where it is. I'm gonna try to rewind. No, it's not here. What? No, that's the, wait. What? Oh, it hadn't even spawned yet. Jesus Christ. All right, here. Ah, uh, this is so sad. Yeah, the Yankos misses Smite. If they if they get Herald here, it does change so much for them because they can get mid tier one and they can even get damage on uh, mid tier two, and then they can also force a Freaker to respond. Like it, it's such a crucial capture. It's really sad. Um, we're gonna go into the next VOD review. Uh, I I do want to say that G two uh, played way better than I thought. Um, and I'm, I'm actually surprised that they didn't drop the ball sooner with this type of a uh, team composition. I, I, I hate these team compositions for the exact reason that I said inside of Champ Select. I think that they're only good when you're better than the opposition, um, although I can understand the reason for picking it inside of a best of one.